Karen Reed sat motionless in the defendant's chair, her face etched with anguish as the prosecution laid out their case against her. She was accused of the unthinkable, murdering her boyfriend John O'Keefe, a 16-year veteran of the Boston Police Department, by running him over with her SUV after a drunken fight. The date was January 29, 2022, and the snow-covered streets of Canton, Massachusetts would become the stage for this tragic drama to unfold. As the first responders took the stand, their testimonies painted a grim picture. John's lifeless body, discovered outside a home where Karen had dropped him off hours earlier for an after-party, bore telltale signs of head trauma. A cracked taillight found near the scene, along with scratches on Karen's vehicle, seemed to corroborate the prosecution's claim that she had backed over him in a rage. But Karen and her defense team were having none of it. Karen Red was framed. Her car never struck John O'Keefe. She did not cause his death, and that means somebody else did, thundered David Yannetti, her fiery attorney, in his opening statement. The defense's narrative was a chilling one. They alleged that the tight-knit community, with its deep ties to law enforcement, had closed ranks against the convenient outsider Karen to cover up a more sinister truth, that John had been brutally beaten at the party and left for dead on that frigid January night. Yanetti grilled the witnesses relentlessly, exposing inconsistencies and flaws in the investigation. A firefighter admitted that John's injuries were consistent with an assault, not a vehicular impact. Police logs contained inaccuracies, and no officer could definitively confirm hearing Karen admit to hitting John, despite the prosecution's insistence. The defense painted a picture of a shoddy, biased investigation riddled with conflicts of interest. The house where the after-party took place was owned by the brother-in-law of a retired Boston police officer. Could friendships and allegiances have clouded judgments and steered the blame toward Karen? As the trial progressed, the defense's accusations grew bolder. They claimed that John's broken taillight had been planted as evidence and that investigators had failed to consider the possibility of an altercation at the party, an oversight that reeked of a cover-up. Karen's army of online supporters, a motley crew of amateur sleuths, podcasters, and bloggers, fervently believed her story. The most vocal among them, the notorious Turtle Boy blogger Aidan Kearney had amassed a staggering 300 blog posts and videos championing Karen's cause. So convincing was his rhetoric that he now faced charges of witness intimidation for his relentless harassment tactics. As the trial raged on, another bombshell emerged. The FBI had launched a parallel investigation into allegations of a police cover-up. Federal agents had interviewed every witness, and according to unverified sources, at least one person had confessed that John had indeed been at the party, a revelation that would obliterate the prosecution's theory. The lead state investigator found himself under scrutiny as well, with an internal probe launched into potential policy violations. The walls seemed to be closing in on the prosecution's case, yet they stubbornly pressed on, determined to secure a conviction against the woman they believed was a jealous, vengeful killer. In the courtroom gallery, Karen supporters rallied daily, their chants and placards a constant reminder of the divisive nature of this case. The judge, recognizing the potential for volatility, had banned all insignia and clothing related to the trial from the premises. As the weeks dragged on, the defense methodically dismantled the prosecution's arguments. They presented evidence that the broken taillight could have occurred when Karen frantically left her home to search for John not at the crime scene. They highlighted the lack of a history of domestic violence between the couple and produced records of their travel plans, hardly the actions of a relationship in turmoil. The trial had become a battle of narratives, each side clinging fiercely to its version of events. Was Karen an enraged woman who had snapped, or an innocent scapegoat caught in the crosshairs of a cover-up? The jury would have to decide, but one thing was certain. This case had captured the public's imagination like few others, fueled by conspiracies, allegations of corruption, and the eternal human fascination with the darkest corners of the human psyche. As the final arguments concluded, Karen could only hope that the truth would prevail. 
She had fought with every fiber of her being, her defense team leaving no stone unturned in their quest to unravel the mysteries surrounding that fateful night. Whether she would walk free or face the prospect of a lifetime behind bars now rested in the hands of twelve strangers. The cameras flashed as she exited the courtroom, her supporters rallying around her with a renewed sense of vigor. Karen knew that whatever the outcome, her life would never be the same. But in that moment, she clung to the hope that justice would be served, and that the real perpetrators, whoever they might be, would finally be unmasked. For now, the snow had melted, but the chill of doubt still lingered, a silent witness to the tragedy that had torn this community asunder. Only time would tell if the truth would ultimately set Karen Reed free.